much for having me. Um, Christine Zinkraff, I am a senior project executive for Elise Crutcher Lewis based in the Portland office. Um, and I touch on a number of market sectors, more recently have had a chance to work on some mass timber buildings, but of course in the Pacific Northwest, it's pretty popular up here. So glad to be talking with you about it today. Yeah, fantastic. And can you tell us a little bit about um, the, the recent drivers and the recent interests that you're having in, in mass timber construction in your part of the world? So um, in Portland, I think you said, is that right? Yes, right. Um, so Northwest part of the United States and yes, a couple of years back, they actually changed the codes in both Oregon and Washington to allow for more uh, mass timber construction, specifically some of the assemblies that weren't previously able to be permitted. So that definitely has been the impetus behind a lot of the new construction in this area, um, where we're seeing a lot more mass timber being implemented. Um, but in general, I think, you know, it's still a buzzword. It continues to be a buzzword, both public and private developers around here. And, you know, we're a bunch of tree huggers anyways, so we might as well fully embrace it. At least that's the uh, the general opinion from the world around us. But um, you know, I think I think anymore, I find that if you're say a structural engineer, for example, and you don't have a mass timber expert on your team, you're potentially missing out on a really big part of the market share. It's just something that's become a lot more prevalent. Um, and there's even around here, there's certain contractors that have specialized work groups that, or even a fully fledged subsidiary that they focus solely on mass timber construction. So I think the key really is just having the right people on your team and help the developers decide from both a cost standpoint and, um, you know, maybe a design standpoint, whether mass timber is the right solution for their building. Hmm. So one of the drivers everyone speaks about and is well aware of is sustainability, which might be more of like a gateway sort of thing to get into some of the other advantages. So what have you seen as the major drivers from your perspective for new developers getting into this space? Definitely sustainability and whether we like it or not, that's marketable. And I think that that's really important for development. Um, biophilic properties, that's something that architects love to talk about. Who doesn't want to walk into a building with beautiful exposed timber overhead? Um, there's absolutely something to be said for the fact that people prefer to work there. It's good for, I think, recruitment and retention. We've talked to a lot of folks who, who live and work in those buildings and they say that people tend to generally be happier. There's higher employee satisfaction. So that's, that's a huge focus. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things that we probably don't talk about enough as an advantage is the fact that CLT is, is prefabrication. And that's something that all contractors are always talking about. We're always trying to take different building components out of the job site in a controlled environment offsite where you can focus on quality and labor is less expensive sometimes. Um, CLT is prefab. And the fact that when we bring that concept up, people usually think equipment skids or large piping systems, this is such a simple and beautiful solution to dropping an entire slab on a building in less than a day. And you have the ability to pre-cut all of your penetrations. It's really plug and play. Mm. One of the drivers you mentioned then was around exposed timber and, and biophilia. I'm interested to know, um, Christine, because in, in our country with a national construction code, uh, there's a lot of, you know, plasterboards in terms of um, from a fire protection point of view. And I believe the international building code is is quite a bit different to us so can you just touch on the amount of exposed timber and what you know height of buildings can you allow for exposed timber just at a really general level in some of the projects you've been a part of sure and i don't have everything memorized so i can't tell you exactly um but i can say i think in portland right now one of the the tallest mass timber buildings that is in planning is eight stories and we always see a topping slab. I, I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably the same case throughout the world, um, but just you mm. can't get the same fire rating without a topping slab. So that always happens. Um, I, I've seen, it's interesting, some of the other kind of combinations that are coming out of the woodwork. Uh, an architect called me a couple of weeks ago, just asking about feedback on, they wanted to put slab on metal deck with exposed timber columns and glue lambs, which I thought is an interesting combination. Um, so people really are experimenting more now that we have the ability to kind of push the envelope with some of the code limitations that are lifted. Yeah. Well, the, the other benefit you mentioned around was prefabrication. Can you tell us a little, a little bit more on speed and how to, you know, overall, what are the key, key ways to optimize and make sure we're maximizing the speed of construction? Yeah, that's that's the biggest selling point for me. Whenever I'm talking to a developer about whether mass timber is the right option for them, speed to market. Because you know, there's still the perception and, and there's some truth to it that 
it's it can be more expensive, um, but time is money. So so that's certainly a consideration. And I think a couple of things you can do to make sure that you get that speed out of your project is your schedule and your sequence have to be dialed. And that has to be, you know, prepare for the worst case, but also the best case at the same time, if you can. Um, yep. That's tough. There's trucking limitations. You can't always control when your material arrives on site. But all that means is, you know, if you if you're able to be more productive than you thought you were, jump on immediately, you know, get all that strapping finished and all your fasteners and, and everything else in. Mm -hmm. and, and does that go to the, the uh, follow on trades and things like that? Does that cross your mind when you're in sequencing? Definitely. It, so, you know, team structure is important too. I think one of the things that um, we've been able to do in the past is if, we're, if we set our CLT faster than expected, immediately you're up there um, putting your temp protection and railings up. You're getting, um, you know, if you have offsite prefabricated wall panels, they can be staged nearby and you can start getting those in place. And so all of that really leads to, I think, a, a more efficient job site as a whole. Yeah. And you mentioned on team there as well. I mean, is that this is a, critical advantage we're talking about now like is this something you bring up on early and who in the team would you sort of uh be be really critical to enable this speed as well yes absolutely when your superintendent's planning the work you have to know who's going to be executing and i think the fact that you know you have however many carpenters you need you have certain folks unloading prepping the panels um, you've got people receiving off of the hook You've got other people that are installing your hardware or your splines. Um, so really thoughtful consideration for where they're staged and how many people you have. And yeah. I mean, team goes out to your design team as well, even before you purchase the material. You can work with the design team, the structural engineer on what fasteners are you gonna be using? How many per strap? Um, get extra eye hooks from the manufacturer. That's another thing, you know, those things come for free. They'll just throw another kit in there. You can be setting your hooks on one panel while the other one's coming off of the the crane and you know just get your production speed up a little bit yeah great and do you have any thoughts on just general de-risking of the project so speed is one thing but being something new especially you've got a lot of experience also here but someone coming in you know fresh uh it's a bit seems to be risky so how do we how do we sort of solve for that i would definitely say again start with the design team you, you can vet a lot before you even get out of the drawing stage so I think one area that you should spend some time and attention on, especially with your structural engineer, is all of your connections, timber to timber, timber to steel, whatever it happens to be. If you get out to the field and it's not something that can be easily put in place or your trade partners had made an assumption and it, it doesn't pencil out, you can be stopped in your tracks, not un unable to stand any columns. Um, so I think that's, you know, that part of the design definitely, um, we talked about topping slabs. That's something else. Think through all aspects of it. Is there a waterproofing membrane? How do you apply that membrane? When do you apply it? Do you need to have specific pour stops that aren't accounted for because you just got this open CLT slab? You know, are you sloping your topping slabs? All those things, constructability wise, you can get those flushed out before you're fabricating. Yeah. In terms of fabrication, what do you think makes the most sense? Like you got like 1D, 2, well, 2D, I guess, is like your panelization. And within 2D, you've got a single CLT panel maybe, or then you've got maybe windows and door frames and all that sort of stuff. And then you've got 3D, which is like a modular. So what, um, from, you know, in your perspective, what do you think makes the most sense for, for a project? And, and you know, what is some of the thinking behind that? 2D versus 3D? Mm. Um. I think most fabricators are using 3D these days. I, I don't know that any of them are doing 2D. Their equipment's so sophisticated that they're using to cut the panels off the line anyways. You might as well go 3D unless there's a huge cost associated with it. I, I can't imagine there is, but any more architects are designing in 3D. Everyone's building in Revit these days. So if you can just pop your CLT 3D into your combined model, that makes it that much easier to coordinate, especially when you're doing your penetrations in the factory. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, I know one of our pre-podcast discussions, you mentioned how you've uh, got experience working on buildings that are sort of existing timber structures. And what are some of the unique challenges of, of say, working on, on you know, retrofitting existing buildings compared to what we're talking about now, which is all about new new timber buildings? Uh, nothing's plumb and square. Um, 
No, you know, you know, one of the things that surprised me, and I guess it shouldn't have, but it did. Um, I'm not a structural engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I can't speak to you know the sheer intention and all that for old growth wood, but I can tell you it is a lot more dense and so much so that the engineer should and can account for that in their calculations. There's different factors that can be used. Um, the one we were talking about previously, there's an adaptive reuse project I worked on in Southeast Portland called the Factor Building. And it's beautiful old, old growth timber, existing old factory. Um, we were putting new seismic reinforcing on it, heavy, thick steel plates. Um, it was taking maybe a half hour to get through just a single three quarter inch hole through a 10 inch beam. That's insane. It's totally, it's a huge yeah. labor suck. We were going through $50 drill bits by like water, you know, That's so just in general, incredibly expensive. We went back to the structural engineer and said, hey, you know, is there anything else we can do? And he went back and recalculated and found we didn't even need to use half of those plates because mm -hmm. of the fact that it was as old timber. So there's certainly, I think, benefits to it, but you just have to be prepared when you're getting ready to work with it and know what you're getting into. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's been great chatting to you, Christine. Can you, one of my final questions is just the, your thoughts on general innovations in this space and where do you think things are evolving and, you know, sort of a blue sky of where you see things maybe in the next five years or so? I hope, I hope that the codes continue to open up and that we can explore new assemblies. I, um, you know, being a renewable resource, that's absolutely the way I think that most of the world wants to go. Um, and the fact that we're seeing it also, again, in new markets, it's pretty popular these days in office. Um, you know, we see it a lot in even multifamily now in single family homes. But I even talked to a developer the other week about they wanted something to differentiate them from their uh, competition. And it's a data center developer, which is technic technically or traditionally just robust kind of, you know, squares, concrete buildings. Well, they were thinking about using this in their lobby space because it would be something to, again, draw people in, biophilia, all of that. So the fact that we're seeing it in different markets, and I hope we'll see different applications in terms of assemblies, the more we test it out, the more we try it, the more we'll find out. Fantastic. Thank you so much. If people want to find out more about yourself or your company, where, where do you want to take them or where should they go? Oh, uh, www.lewisbuild.com.